Nikki Haley standing by comments that she made supporting the jury in writer E. Jean Carroll's $83 million defamation verdict against Donald Trump. Take a look at what she had to say on Fox News yesterday. You're taking some new fire from uh, Donald Trump's campaign and supporters for what you said about the E. Jean Carroll case on Meet the Press yesterday. Of course, the president was found liable in that case. A jury awarded her $83.3 million. Here's what you said when you were asked about it. I absolutely trust the jury, and I think that they made their decision based on the evidence. So, so the New York Times wrote an article around that in which it said in part, quote, four weeks before what could be the decisive Republican primary in South Carolina, Ms. Haley is trying to navigate an extremely narrow and treacherous path, finding a way to diminish Mr. Trump's hold on her party's electorate without decisively turning conservative voters against her the way they have destroyed other Trump critics. How do you navigate that path, Governor? It cracks me up that people try and overanalyze. I just tell the truth as I see it. I think there have been politics played with prosecutors that have brought on some of these cases. I think there's been politics played even with the judges. But I do think American juries still get it right. They listen to the evidence. They make the decision based on the evidence. And I do still trust the, any American that sits on a jury. I trust that they're making the right decision. Well, we, we, we just have to. I mean, th that is the center of, of our judicial system. You have to trust fellow voters that get in a jury pool. And, and sometimes they seem to get, get it right, and sometimes they seem to get it wrong. But you have to have faith in the system that more often than not, they get it right. Well, compare it's a that, constitution, that to know. Republican senators who defended Trump last spring after he was found liable for sexual assault and defamation. In the words of Marco Rubio at that time, quote, that jury is a joke. The whole case is a joke. Jen, can you imagine really? that? I mean, can you, no. I guess we can imagine six years later, but any United States senator, and they do it, that they will trash any institution that checks Donald Trump's absolute lust for absolute power. And in this case, Marco Rubio called a jury a joke. Marco Rubio, who wasn't in the courtroom, didn't hear any of the evidence, didn't have any of the judge's instructions, didn't know what the law was in that particular case. And it, it, again, just attack the judge, attack the jury system, attack American democracy, attack whatever it takes to lift up Donald Trump. Yeah, and, and, and Trump's saying that it's part of a Biden witch hunt, even though it's happening in, you know, wholly independently of Biden. And this case was filed in 2019 before uh, uh, Joe Biden was president. I think it's important that, I mean, Haley walks a fine line and she never criticizes Trump at the foundation of what he, you know, she'll never go to the conduct. Right. Right. She won't she won't go that far. She won't go to the conduct on the Jan six cases or on the mar lago case or on the E. Jean Carroll case. But to defend the jury, that's that's like defending the election. That's defending, you know, that's that's defending the process. That's actually an important thing. Actually, it's important for for Republicans to hear this. It's report, no. important for Republicans and swing voters and independents to hear a Republican say you know, to attack Trump and for a Republican to uphold the jury system. Well, you, you know, Richard, it was it was always conservatives who were supposed to defend institutions going all the way back to Edmund Burke, who talked about how, you know, uh, radical zealots could tear down institutions in a day that were built up over centuries of time. And here you have, ironically, the same, you know, the same people that were running around defending institutions in the late 60s and early 70s that were under attack from the far left, now they're the ones attacking those same institutions that are foundational to this republic. That's what's stunning about it. The idea that what Nikki Haley's saying is in any way exactly. remarkable. This is pure American classic conservatism, trial by jury. It's an institution. That's what conservatives used to believe in. And the Republican Party has so strayed from conservatives, it's become a populist, personalist right. party, and this is the consequence. Well, and just think about how dangerous uh, the consequences will be uh, now that we have a Texas governor. Yes. Just saying, so I'm, going to, I'm going to ignore a Supreme Court ruling. See, because we talk about all the dangers that Donald Trump poses. That's one of them. Donald Trump, if he gets into power again, 
he's going to be Orban. He's going. He's going to. You know, I don't think he's going to even try to do what Netanyahu is, is, is trying to do in Israel. I think he's just going to go straight there and he's going to ignore the Supreme Court's rulings. And then we have a constitutional crisis of the first order. Yeah, Republicans suggesting they get to pick and choose which Supreme Court decisions they want to abide by or not is so dangerous. I think we're going to see in the year ahead as these Trump legal cases move forward and decisions come down against him, we will see them reject those and move forward. Even before Trump were to get in office and to your point where he elected again, I do think that would all go out the window. He will yeah. he will just simply do what he wants. And I and I think this is part of that argument that the democracy argument that the president President Biden is trying to make and the Biden team really thinks that it's, it is important to Tamika's point that like Republicans are hearing this from Nikki Haley. I mean, that that's the bare minimum. Yeah. Nikki Haley is doing the bare minimum. That's a low bar to clear. But she did clear it. And she's doing it in places like on Fox where Republicans, viewers who love Trump are hearing it maybe for the first time. They're not going to listen to Joe Biden say it. It's such a commentary in the state of the Republican Party though, to stop and congratulate <laughs> Nikki Haley for supporting the jury system <laughs> in America. But here we are. We're learning more about the border security provisions in the bipartisan Senate deal negotiators have been working on for months. Two sources tell NBC News that legislation would grant the federal government new authority to shut down the border once crossings reach a certain threshold. In addition, there would be new restrictions on how approved migrants are released into the country. The sources say the Senate team hopes to make the text of the bill public this week. But Republicans continue to actively trash a bill they have not read. Former President Trump is claiming a border bill is not even needed. Speaker Mike Johnson posted on X yesterday the bill is a non-starter in the House. And many House Republicans echoed that sentiment yesterday. Joe Biden has the power to address this unprecedented crisis tomorrow by reversing the 64 executive actions he took to effectively open our southern border. The president has the ability right now, the power to stop it. 212F, he could use that power. He could undo many of the orders that Tom referenced. But he chooses not to, because this is all a sham and it's purposeful. It is a purposeful effort to deluge our society and to undermine our way of life, to destroy Western civilization. Biden is salivating at the prospect of some staggeringly horrible Senate compromise bill to enshrine that this ongoing disaster continues. You never give in when our national security is constantly being threatened by the traitorous actions of the executive branch. The traitorous, traitorous actions. Wait, but, but wait, they're the I ones. I thought they wanted this. They wanted it. And now they don't want it. They care so much you know, about and, not caring and, and, and at they, all. They throw around words like, by the way, I'm sorry, but going back to Edmund Burke, what was he writing about? The radicalism, the zealotry of the French Revolution. Do you, you know what the Jacobins, the, what the zealots did? They accused everybody of being zealots, anybody, and being traitors. And then they take them to the guillotine. Everybody was a traitor. And here these people are calling Joe Biden a traitor for doing what Joe Biden has heard them saying wanted him to do all along. And in Oklahoma, <laughs> poor James Lang Langford, one of the most conservative guys who criticizes Biden almost every day uh, on Twitter. You, you see him, and he's put together the most conservative bill on the border in a generation. Everybody says that, that's serious. And now you got these clowns going up there saying he's traitorous. Um, you've got Hugh Hewitt, who was for it, but now he's against it. Uh, J.B. Last wrote, wrote an article about this. He was for it, but now he's against it because Donald Trump's against it. Newt Gingrich goes on Fox News last night and says, this is the worst thing that's ever, 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 ever happened. It's the dumbest, stupidest, this, that, the other. All because Donald Trump one day, they all liked the bill, and then Donald Trump said, don't pass a bill that might hurt me politically. And now, <laughs> traitorous, <laughs> stupid. Turn the car around. Turn yeah, they turned the car around. How sad and how pathetic. I mean, if somebody had come up to me when I was in Congress and told me to do that, no. I would have, I'd, I'd have two words for them. And the second would be off, and I would keep walking. I wouldn't even break a stride, and most of the people I served with were that way, too. Which, again, begs the question, who are these cowards that will just completely comply with everything 
dear leader says. And is there anything they wouldn't do for him? You have to ask nothing. the question. I mean, there's anything. nothing. Mike Johnson has said publicly on TV and in interviews. Yes, I talk to the pres former president almost every day, and he's telling us not to do this. So the thing yeah. we've been clamoring for for generations, and more specifically in recent months, all of a sudden we're against. Really, it. They, they they will not fund Israel mm -hmm. right now because Donald Trump does not want this bill to go through. They are allowing Vladimir Putin to, to, to beat Ukraine. He, he, he now has the advantage over there because Donald Trump wants Vladimir Putin to win. And, and Mike Johnson has gone right along voting against every bit of funding all along uh, for Ukraine. And, you know, I, I do wonder where where. Where are the pro-Ukrainian Republicans? Where are the pro-freedom Republicans? Where are the Reagan Republicans? I thought Chairman McCall would be fighting. I haven't heard anything from Chairman McCall about this. Does he want the Ukrainians to keep dying? Does he want the Ukrainians to keep getting pounded by the Russian invaders? Is this his legacy? Is this, this, this is the House's legacy, by the way. This is the House's legacy right now. And I hope McCall and I hope the rest of them have a great time telling their children and the grandchildren that Vladimir Putin uh, was back on his heels, but he rushed through. He finally got Ukraine. Then he started going to the Balkan states. Then he started going across the rest of Eastern Europe, all because they were more afraid of Donald Trump uh, than, than, than they were for freedom. It's really, it's just, it's sickening. And the leadership in Ukraine now just says out loud, the future of this war is in the hands of the United States Congress. Ah. That's it, full stop. So it's up to them, says Ukraine. Let's bring into the conversation the co-founder and CEO of Axios, Jim Vandehei. Jim, good morning. So uh, what's your view on, on, let's go back to the immigration deal for just a yeah. second. As Joe said, Senator Lankford has the Biden administration now agreeing to things that would have been unthinkable just a few months ago on immigration policy. They feel like they have the best available deal and that they, the House should take it while they can. What's your sense? Does this have any chance at all, first, of getting out of the Senate, because all of a sudden that's falling apart a little bit on the Republican yeah. side, but then when it gets to the House, we just heard from a whole host of Republicans that it's going nowhere. Yeah, I think it has a realistic chance of getting out of the Senate. I agree with you that it's one of the most conservative, if not the most conservative uh, bill that we've seen maybe in our lifetime in terms of clamping down on what's going to happen at the southern border. Uh, it has no chance whatsoever being signed into law, even though President Biden has made it clear he would sign it. And it's because like, it's Trump's party and Trump's opposed to it. And he's got his executioner and that's Johnson and the, and the rest of the leadership in the House. They've made it clear it's dead. It's dead. I, I don't see any chance that it would pass. Jen, is this something that, that Democrats can use against Republicans? For, I mean, for killing the yeah. best border bill? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, 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 the uh, you know, on Friday, the president said he would sign this bill. He said he would shut down the, I mean, he said he yeah. would shut down, really get, give him the authority to shut down the border and he will do it the day that he signs the bill. The people who have no credibility are the House Republicans, right? Yeah. And and you have Senate Republicans have credibility. You had Mitt Romney come out and say out loud what happened in the Senate Republican caucus, that we're not going to act on the, that the leader does not want to move this bill because Trump doesn't want it. You've had House Republicans say the same thing out loud. You've had Biden say, I will do this. I mean, this is this is maybe his biggest vulnerability, President Biden's <laughs> biggest vulnerability in the election. And Trump and the House Republicans have mismanage us in a way that they've handed him the ability <laughs> finally to break through about what they have been doing on the border, what they're willing to do. And, you know, you, you it's know, not going to convince needs, Trump supporters, but you know it's going to convince he swing needs, voters. He needs to go to the border. He needs to stand at the border and yeah. he needs to say, I oh, want on. to shut down the border. And everything he has done. Donald Trump won't let me. I want yeah. to shut down the border with a bill that Republicans call the toughest border security bill ever. I want to shut down the border. Donald Trump won't let Republicans do it. He needs to go to the border and do that, and he needs to go to the Knesset and have the same conversation with the Israelis. In both cases, yeah. Joe Biden has to confront the opposition and just use the power of the bully pulpit. That is the Oval Office. That's, that's what's left now. And he's, in both yeah. cases, he's got implacable people who won't go along. They're testing. They're, they're just testing the boundaries, the constitutional boundaries. Here they're going over the line. 
This is what Donald Trump is going to do if Donald Trump's elected president. And there will be no National Guard to call out to enforce the Supreme Court decisions because Donald Trump will control the National Guard. I, this is so obvious. He talks about Orban. He talks about illiberal democracy. He talks about all of his, his uh, tyrants who are, who are his friends. Uh, and, and, and then you see Republicans openly defying the United States Supreme Court that's exactly what Donald Trump's going to do if Donald Trump's elected again. It's just so obvious. Yeah, um, we've talked a lot on the show about how the institutions will start to break if Donald Trump is, is, is elected. One thing I, I want to say that I'm starting to feel a little bit better about things. I, a couple of months ago, I was terrified that Donald Trump was going to be next president. Donald Trump keeps losing. You know, I'm, I'm shifting to E. Jean Carroll for a second. We watch him lose $93 million. We're going to watch him lose a civil case. We're going to watch him lose an election fraud case. We watched him lose for six years. We see him blubbering. Somehow in the last month or so, things have turned a little bit, and this would-be fascist that seemed to be on a fast track seems to be getting diverted a little bit. I feel a little bit more bullish coming off of Steve Ratner, coming off a lot of things. This country does not want our institutions to fail. I believe in our electorate, and I'm feeling a little bit better about things, about our would-be dictator. Jen, I, I, tell me, uh, the last month, we've yeah. obviously, Donald Trump has uh, gotten very confused on stage. He thinks right. that Joe Biden is Barack Obama and Nikki Haley is Nancy, uh, Nancy Pelosi. Pelosi. Uh, he, he, gets, he gets very addled. And Donnie is right. He gets pounded in these court cases. And again, it's not a deep state conspiracy. It's 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 a jury of his own peers. It's voters uh, in you know, where he does business. And it's only going to get worse. I mean, when when the when the judge doesn't the judge uh, in the um, fraud case, doesn't he, he said by tomorrow, yeah. that's got to be by right. tomorrow. Week, yeah. That's mm -hmm. probably two hundred and fifty, three hundred yeah. million dollars. Yeah. And that's money Donald Trump does not have. I've had the same sense, even just in the last week that Donnie said, is that he, he seems vulnerable in a way that he didn't yeah. months ago. You know, and I think it's a combination of us realizing 50 to 60 percent of the party is with them, you know, maybe 40 percent or not. Wasn't it striking in, in Iowa? We sat there talking yeah. about Iowa. And then a couple of days later, we realized that Republicans make up about a third of Iowa voters, and only 14% of those 33%, not 14% right. of the electorate, 14% of 33% of Iowans actually voted for Donald Trump, well, half of those, so 7% Yeah, even of though the enthusiasm is supposed to be on his right. side, and, you know, it was cold and everything like that, but then in, in New Hampshire... 40% of the people there said that the people that Republicans that turned out said that they would uh, not support him if he was convicted. 25% of Iowans said they would not support him even if he's just the general election nominee. Then you had Nikki Haley making effect, you know, a Republican making effective attacks on him. And interestingly, she's playing the anti-establishment card, right? She's like, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. he has all the endorsements. He's got the party behind him. I'm the upstart here. And she's sort of right. playing his game. She's definitely getting under his skin. Mm -hmm. Then you have Biden taking him on on the border. That, you know, he's Trump is now responding to Biden. He's he's yeah. looking to see what President Biden is saying about the border. And then he's responding to that. And then the E. Jean Carroll case, he, he just weak. keeps he looks he's and, he and it's like it's like the artifice is falling. Yeah. Now we've been here before, and it's not been sustained. But you know, like you said, there's the civil case next, the civil case in, in days, and then we have all the other court cases. And as long, you know, forever, how as long as Haley keeps this up, and the Biden team, even just on Twitter, just the way they are lifting up all of his, anything that he says that sounds a little crazy or a little lost, they are really they are way more aggressive. In I, I, I've got to say on the Biden on the Biden campaign, we talked about it last week. They actually look like a challenger. If you look, if you look. Uh, on, on how rapidly they respond. They're not playing it safe. It's a lot. I thought Fetterman had great, great online presence when he was running for the Senate. That's what Biden's uh, campaign looks like. I mean, they are they are going after Trump aggressively and where Trump will ramble on and on forever. They'll say, watch Donald Trump say this stupid thing. Yeah, the watch Donald Trump get confused here. Burp. 
Watch Donald Trump mis mistake leaders of, of two countries here. Boop, and it's just constantly, and you're sitting there going, wow. Pretty good. Yeah, the rapid response team's really picked up. They have staffed up. It was a slow developing, a slow building campaign. They're hiring people left and right. They've shifted top White House aides now over to, the, to Wilmington to be the campaign side. Uh, they recognize that they've, right about some of the midterms, we've, we're starting to talk about this. They've realized they need to make this, a, they need to go on the attack and make it much more of a contrast election. Don't make it a referendum on the incumbent. You've got two incumbents here, they're sort of saying. Choose. And they feel that they feel good about the choice. They have some worries about the Democratic base. They need to excite them. But about independent swing voters, they feel good that they're going to stay home. And it's not just that the online presence, the other person who's going after Donald Trump, is Joe Biden. Biden, who for about a year and a half refused to say Trump's name. And there's some data out in the last week or so about he's now peppering every speech with Trump. He's going right after him. Right. And he's taking some of his perceived weaknesses, say his age, yeah. and turning it into a strength and using it as a cudgel to go after Trump. You also hear, like, you know, some Democrats cringe when Joe Biden has a moment on the stage or where, you know, stumbles through a speech at times. You're starting to hear Republicans say that about Donald sure. Trump. Not the died in the wool MAGA supporters right. who go to the rallies, but that is particularly that riff, long riff, not a slip of the tongue, where he confused Nancy Pelosi with Nikki mm -hmm. Haley. You're starting to hear independents and old line Republicans, the ones we talk about all the time, go, oof. Donald yeah. Trump that's was always, that's, that's not great. Donald Trump, Trump was always about strength, and he's looking weak. He looks weak. He, looks yeah. weak. he, he was shut up by Gene Carroll. Let's, Donald, can you keep your mouth shut at this point? Because you, you, he's in the corner. And he won't be able to. He keeps getting beat up. He has beat up Donald Trump. He's grumpy. He's soft. He's weak. He doesn't see. We I, I, my response to the authoritative in waiting is he looks real weak. Mm. Well, yeah. He, he actually has shut up. Uh, since the $83 Which million. Which makes him, in his own mind, you know? yeah, look we'll weak but because he, he thinks that he should be well, able to I mean, e. G. never Carroll beat him. have to beat him, pay beat him money. Badly. Beat him up really badly yeah. in court. Humiliated him. I mean, I just, whoop. I can't <laughs> imagine that. That'd be pretty rough with Man, everything else small. going on. But you see small. people, you see people, though, you're right, the Republicans that will see Donald Trump going, he'll be talking, they go, Nikki Haley, Nikki Haley, Nikki Haley, then he'll stop. Because he's like, wait, that's not the name. And then he goes back to her, just like when one of the best clips is when he chokes on the name Obama. And that's why we're going to be, Obama. and then he stops and then he just goes there because his mind can't retrieve Joe Biden's name, which is fascinating. By now, most of us have heard the infamous recording of then President Trump pushing Georgia's Secretary of State to change the outcome of the 2020 election. I only need 11,000 votes. Fellas, I need 11,000 votes. Give me a break. So look, all I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more that we have, because we won the state. There's nothing wrong with saying that, you know, uh, that you've recalculated. Well, now a new book reveals the extent of the pressure campaign on Georgia and the lengths that some Trump associates have gone to in order to keep an investigation into their actions at bay. The book is entitled Find Me the Votes, a hard charging Georgia prosecutor, a rogue president and the plot to steal an American election and the co-authors, award-winning investigative journalist Michael Isakoff and Daniel Clydman join us now. Congratulations uh, on the book. Congratulations, guys. A couple things just jump out here. Right? Yeah. And let's just start with Sidney Powell. You say one of the president's top legal advisors plotted criminal break-ins at election offices around the country in order to seize machines and sensitive yeah. software. Talk about yeah. that. I mean, look, that is a perfect example of just how far the Trump people were prepared to go, in particular in Georgia, to um, overturn the results of the election. Sidney Powell, who, by the way, as we discovered in reporting this, was in regular communication with Donald Trump the whole time, throughout the time. She's calling Trump in the White House. Trump is calling down to her and her Confederate, Lynn Wood, a full-blown QAnon adherent. And one of the plans, she, you know, she was convinced that there were Venezuelan socialists who had planted secret algorithms in Dominion voting machines. In early on, just within a week after the election, she she uh, draws up a plan for criminal break-ins 
uh, at election offices around the country to seize those Dominion machines and to protect the operatives who would, who would do that, assigned to do that, with hunting licenses, yeah. which were preemptive presidential pardons. Right. And we trace how it goes from that to an actual break-in that took place in this rural county in Georgia, Coffee County operatives. It's been charged yeah. as a case of computer theft theft in the Georgia. And, and, and Daniel, it's just, it's just a bizarre moment you guys have here with Lindsey Graham, who fights the subpoena for months. After he's, he testifies, he goes up and he hugs Fannie Willis, thanks her, says that was so cathartic. What? Uh, and it threw him, <laughs> you know, it, 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 supposedly he threw Trump under the bus during the testimony. Talk about that bizarre encounter. Well, we talked to people who were in the grand jury, uh, grand jurors who saw this and described exactly what happened and throw, threw him under the bus. That's how they described it. And as you pointed out, Joe, Lindsey he said, threw Lindsey, Trump under the bus. He did. He said, among other things, he said, you know, if Martians told Donald Trump that the election was stolen, he would have believed it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the kind of lighter moments is when he also accused Donald Trump of cheating at, at, at golf. Right. But the, I love the word cathartic uh, because here's a guy, uh, Lindsey Graham, uh, who uh, was the John McCain, uh, the maverick who bucked his own party, was his his mentor and his hero. Trump comes along and all of a sudden he's uh, swearing obeisance to Donald Trump. Um, and you have to wonder whether there's some internal struggle going on inside uh, mm -hmm. inside Lindsey Graham. And finally, he gets in front of a grand jury, is sworn to tell the truth, uh, and he unburdens himself. Mm -hmm. uh, so so he, he calls it cathartic, and he hugs Fonnie Willis. An extraordinary moment. Now, they're denying it, but yeah, you, you have tested. Oh, yeah. You have tested. We have an eyewitness. We have eyewitnesses. We have multiple yeah. sources. Uh, so yeah. uh, it, it happened. Yeah. He was caught oh, telling the truth, realizing oh, Trump, <laughs> Donald Trump, and had to say it was BS. It's kind of yeah. like Mark Meadows that writing his book, Trump attacking it, and then Mark Meadows <laughs> yeah. attacking his own book. Calling his own book fake news. Yes, yeah, exactly. A stunning moment. Good job. Um, let's talk about the phone call, Mike, that we just played there. Yep. How that came to pass. You actually talked to the aide to Secretary of State Raffensperger, this is who helped the, to make this happen. Right, who helped, who made it happen. Yeah. This is one of the extraordinary stories, uh, un, unknown st uh, t stories of the whole 2020 election battle. Um, look, uh, Georgia was ground zero for everything that took place during the 2020 election. It's where Trump's uh, pressure campaign was most furious, most intense. Um, it is worth noting that Republicans in Georgia, Republican office holders, at every step of the way thwarted everything he was trying to do. From Raffensperger, obviously, um, Chris Carr, the attorney general who refused, vowed to resign rather than uh, back Trump's campaign to uh, uh, have a special session of the state legislature. But the one that stands out and made the most difference was this aide to Raffensperger, Jordan Fuchs, a 30-year-old political consultant, um, unknown to the wider world. Um, Meadows reaches out to her to set up that phone call. They've been avoiding talking to Trump because Trump was suing them, you know, and, you know, she didn't want her boss on the phone with Donald Trump, have Trump completely distort the contents. So she decides on her own, unilaterally, she's gonna tape the call. Um, she, she's on the phone call the whole time. She puts herself on mute, so you never hear her voice, but she taped the whole thing, and this had it a, not been for that, wow. we would not have those. So, by the way, it was an extremely evidence. risky thing for her to do because she was visiting her grandparents at the time, which was a two-party, in Florida, which is a two-party right. consent yeah. state. She needed the consent of whoever she was taping. She didn't get it, exposed herself to potential criminal prosecution. I don't think that's going to happen at the end, but it was a risky yeah. and courageous thing to do. And she did. She's never talked about it publicly, but when she testified before the special grand jury, under immunity, she acknowledged she. So Brad Raffensperger did wow. not know at the time. Not anyway, the time. she had reported. not told Raffensperger. She had not told Meadows, and wow. of course, she didn't tell Trump. It was uh, uh, a hinge people, of history. The, the yes. single wow. Wow. gutsiest and most consequential act of the post-election mm -hmm. saga. So Daniel, yeah. a, a phenomenon we're seeing right now is a lot of threats against people, prosecutors, uh, politicians, and the like, who stand up to Donald Trump. There's a, a wave of swatting incidents. Fonnie Willis, the mm -hmm. DA down in Fulton County, has also received a lot of those. You have a sad evidence, proof of calls, text, emails, voice memos, assassination attempts. In the, in the days before the indictment, uh, these threats are intensifying against her. And 
her security staff, they, they notice a, an assassination threat on a deep web, dark web ma ma MAGA site. The best time to shoot her is when she leaves the building. So they mm -hmm. set up an elaborate operation um, in, that involves a body double. After the midnight indictment uh, is, uh, she announces the indictment, which she, she, after the indictment, about one in the morning, she and her team go uh, to the back office where she changes out of her business attire uh, into sweats, a t-shirt, and a baseball cap. Meanwhile, someone on her staff, a woman about the same size, an investigator, uh, changes into clothes uh, that are that resemble what Fonnie Willis for a black business suit, a uh, string of pearls, and a black bob uh, wig. The body double uh, goes out the front of the courthouse. Wearing a Kevlar. Wearing a, she is vest. wearing a bulletproof yes. vest. Goes out of the front of the courthouse, gets in the official uh, black SUVs. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Fonnie Willis and her team go out, slip out the back of the courthouse, get into civilian cars, and leave uh, for an undisclosed smuggle uh, out of the office, undisclosed mm -hmm. location. Yeah. Uh, really wow. dramatic yeah. moment. A um, sign of just how these threats have, you know, had I, such an impact on everybody involved. And I in only like, can I make one more just quick point about the the threats, which is, um, you know, the the big political moment uh, qu question of, of this moment, which you guys talk about on this show all the time, is why s so many mainstream Republicans, so-called normal Republicans, haven't stood up to Donald Trump. A lot of it is expediency, I'm sure, but a lot of it, we're told, uh, is these threats, particularly people who are worried about their families. Right. Uh, and we saw this all over Georgia. You know, Brad Raffensperger's wife uh, who we talked to, we saw the text message that she was getting, the, the torrent of messages, you know, horrific uh, sexual threats against her over and over again. And, you know, Mitt Romney um, said in his, his uh, memoir that he pays $5,000 a day to protect his, himself and his family. Most people can't afford that, even in the Senate. Yeah. So this is, a, this is corrosive to democracy, and it's, it's a pretty... Uh, pretty serious thing. Water yeah. Republican said that after January 6th. It's just a threat to our families. We can't say anything. Absolutely. Before we let you guys go, we know, as we talk about Fonnie Willis here, that the Trump legal team wants her off the case because of her alleged relationship with the special prosecutor, Nathan right. Wade, that she appointed. Um, is her role in this case, in your assessment, in jeopardy here? Could she be pulled off, and how would it affect it? Well, she's going to be filing a response later this week, and it will be her, the first response she makes to the allegations. And, you know, we have reason to believe it's going to be a pretty vigorous pushback, on at least on some of what has been alleged. Um, look, there's no question that she, this was a lapse in judgment on her part to have a relationship with Nathan Wade, uh, who was the chief prosecutor on the case. But that said, it is worth keeping this in perspective. Um, none of that had any impact on the case whatsoever. It didn't deny anybody their constitutional rights. It was not a case of prosecutorial misconduct. Um, it doesn't influence any of the evidence in the case. Um, so we'll see uh, after she responds and the judge has a hearing February 15th. But well, I The legal threshold for disqualification is an actual conflict of interest. It's a very high bar. And at the end of the day, the judge is going to have to make the decision based on law, based on uh, precedent, and there has to be that conflict. And I don't know that there is. Well, and, and the conflict. question is, did a conflict disadvantage a defendant? Exactly. And, and, exactly. and, 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 and no in evidence case, of that at all. There, not only is there no evidence of that, but if you're arguing that, that the prosecutor got the job because of a personal relationship, well... It wasn't based on merit, so that would actually help the defendant. It's a good point. It's a good I'm point. Sorry. It's a good I'm, point. I'm, I'm good just point. saying there's just not an yeah. argument to be made. Yeah. Just one other quick that, point. That, you know, one of the things we do report on the book is she had a hard time finding anybody to take that job because of the threats. The yeah. former governor of Georgia, Roy Barnes, yeah. turned her down saying wow. he didn't want a bodyguard following him around for the rest of his life. Another mm. federal prosecutor mm. did. Mm. So, you know, it, there's a lot of complexities to this yeah. story that have not been All right. Been the new book is entitled Find Me the Votes, a hard-charging Georgia prosecutor prosecutor, a rogue president, and the plot to steal an American election. Fascinating new details. Michael Isakoff and Daniel Kleidman, thank you both very much for Thanks, coming to the show. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Donald Trump is trying to take credit for the booming U.S. stock market that uh, we're seeing um, <laughs> under President Joe he, Biden. He said he said the stock market would crash if Joe he Biden was president. He wants it to so that he can be the no, savior. No, but he said in 2020 if Joe Biden no. is president, it's going to crash. Oh, it's not doing that. On a day where both the Dow mm. and S&P closed at record highs, the former president wrote on social media in all caps, quote, All right, all right. we're not, not going to read this. Blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. But no, here's no, he, the thing. You don't get it both ways, big boy. He has to do uh, something he, with his fingers you, you, because you, you he can't the same Pick one. Uh, the Biden campaign responded to Trump's claims, writing in a statement to The Hill, quote, Thank you, Donald, for lifting up today's strong economic news. But on this planet, Joe Biden is the mm. president. Here, here. Meanwhile, even uh, critics of the Biden administration are having to admit how well the economy is doing. The Washington Post on Sunday laid out the case that the United States has had the world's best recovery post-pandemic. On Fox Business yesterday, Steve Forbes was asked about that headline. But are they right? Is America, does America now have the best recovery? Well, yes, it because does. the rest of the world is doing so poorly. Germany is now the weakest developed country in the world. Phenomenal. And one big reason, because of their green policies, which have tripled the price of electricity. Britain, the same thing, barely registering any growth. Japan, dead in the water. China, we know the problems there. The key thing is, the reason the economy is doing so well is government spending. How long can you keep that up? Ask Argentina, where eventually that leads you. Well, the, the, the thing about uh, the crazy way they do GDP is they count government spending as a plus. So that's why the Soviet Union looks so good for so long and East Germany looks so good for so long, is government spending counts as a positive thing like private investment. We know that's nonsense. I'll bet that the next time KJP or the president takes any kind of questions of any kind on the economy, that Washington Post article is going to be right there, front and center. We've got the best recovery. And that's a pretty good political slogan in an election year. Well, because we have the best recovery. I'm, I'm not exactly, I know Steve, I love Steve, I'm not exactly sure the middle part, what he was saying after he said, yeah, we have the best, but we have the best recovery, the best post-COVID re re recovery. We got into a little trouble because Donald Trump had two massive COVID spending bills that dwarfed Joe Biden's. After he and kept there was COVID way, from the country. After, so after there was way too much money there. But people died. But, but, but yeah, we have the best economy in the world. Just And, and you can go where, I mean, ask anybody. You can ask the, the, like the most conservative writers for the Wall Street Journal. We're saying it on the editorial page. Why? Because we have the best economy in the world since Donald Trump left office. Let's bring in right now. Should I go over and talk? No, to please him? don't. Oh, Stay right here in your just, chair. I'm kind of a, I'm a no. rambling man today. No. Steve Ratner's got it, and he's going to handle it from here on, okay? Steve Ratner. Hi, Steve. Uh, what's going on with the economy? What's going on with the economy? Well, I think Joe should just come over here and do yeah. my charts for me. No, okay. no. Be much better at no. it than I would. Touch the screen. I want to touch right the screen. Here. Like Vanna. Yeah. No. A baiting inflation. Steve, take it away. Uh, look, the, the idea of Steve Forbes comparing us to Argentina in the Soviet Union is so utterly <laughs> and completely, completely ridiculous. We have, in fact, the best economy in the world, and we have it for a whole variety of reasons, uh, including a lot of the policies that were put in place in the last year over Joe Biden. So let's take a look at economic growth. Many people have talked, uh, including myself, had worried about recession as we tried to ring out inflation. That's not what we've gotten. We've gotten incredibly strong growth that has exceeded estimates in almost every quarter. We grew 3% last year. That is a very healthy rate of growth. And perhaps the best news for Joe Biden is that the idea of a recession has come out of economists' forecasts for the most part. And while growth might be a bit slower this year than it was in the past, it is still strong, healthy, and consistent. So on the growth side, the economy is looking really good. Obviously, we worried an enormous amount about inflation. And inflation has well outperformed in the positive sense of coming down what I think almost any of us thought was possible. You can see that and this is what we call core inflation. This takes out energy and food, which tend to bounce around a lot and looks at the core of the economy. This is what the Fed likes to look at when it sets interest rates. And you can see that core inflation got up to 6%. That was unfortunate, variety of reasons. But, none, but the drop in it 
has been really almost uh, faster than anything I can remember in my time doing this. And in the last two quarters, the core inflation rate was down to 2%. That is the Fed's target. Hey, Steve, what's caused the fast growth? You said that's one of the fastest drops you've seen. What, what, what's caused that? Well, a lot of it was the fact that the government spent money, and it's not what Steve Forbes was saying about how government spending is in the GDP and right. all this stuff. It's what happened was that the government leaned in, variety of programs, the infrastructure uh, bill, the clean, uh, the IRA for the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, and so forth, and it created jobs, and it got the economy going. We have this incredibly fast rate, for example, of production of alternative energy sources right now, of solar and wind and all that creates jobs and that's a lot of what's been going on here well let's talk about the jobs uh, sh talk talk about how the job growth just keeps going on and on sure so again the uh, the great American jobs machine as we like to call it has been has been uh, chugging along you can see down here the 2000 to 2019 average that's Donald Trump's average we have exceeded that in most months we have also exceeded this little green stuff are the months in which we've exceeded what the economists thought was going to happen, and it's regularly outperformed. So we've had this very steady, consistent jobs growth. We're going to have another number on Friday. Looks like it'll be 175,000 new jobs again created. Unemployment rate is down below 4%. That has long been considered full employment. And so we're doing great on that front. And then the part that, again, many people don't appreciate. And look, inflation was worse than we wanted it to be, worse than we hoped it would be. But nonetheless, people have continued to actually outpace inflation. In 2004, the average worker's income went up by 1.6% more than inflation. In other words, real wage increases. You look down here at the 2017 to 2019 average, right. you can call that the Donald Trump era. You had barely any, like t a tenth of a percent of growth in wages after inflation. We had 1.6% last year. And what also isn't on this chart, uh, but a, an important fact, is wages are growing faster for those at the bottom than those at the top for the first time in a very long time. So income inequality is still huge, but it is narrowing. Uh, if former President Trump is lashing out against the head of the United Auto Workers for endorsing President Biden last week and for these comments over the weekend, take a look. Joe Biden has a history of serving others and serving the working class and fighting for the working class, standing with the working class. Donald Trump has a history of serving himself and standing for the billionaire class, and that's contrary to everything that working class people stand for. Trump blasted a UAW, uh, UAW President Sean Fain on his social media platform, accusing him of, quote, selling the automobile industry right into the big, powerful hands of China, adding, quote, get rid of this dope and vote for Donald J. Trump. I will bring the automobile industry back to our country. Yeah, yeah no. Let's bring in Sean Fain right now. Sean, I know that you're a sensitive man, and I know these words from Donald J. Trump. Uh, with his, what did he have? His foot, uh, bone, bone spurs. spurs. Yeah, yeah bone, spurs. bone spurs. He's such a and tough they guy. they very painful. I, I know it upsets you a great deal. Um, uh, talk about what's at stake in this election for workers and, um, and, and talk about what's at stake for those people in your own union that are like, eh, yeah, I, I know he, he supports billionaires and multinational corporations, but I just kind of like him. I'm going to vote for him. Well, you know, thanks for having me. I, and honestly, what this all comes down to, you know, when we look at this election is, are we going to go continue to go forward? Or are we going to go backwards? And, you know, Trump's billionaire economy, you know, Trump's tax breaks that he put in place when he was president that benefited, you know, 85 percent of the benefit went to the top one percent, uh, you know, and never expired. Meanwhile, the, the, the minuscule benefits that went to working class people it had an expiration date on it. Um, you know, that doesn't work for us. Uh, you know, we look at, you know, what he's done, the body of work, you know, throughout his presidency and, and then Joe Biden through his presidency. It's a real clear picture. I mean, Donald Trump did not stand with working class people uh, when he had the opportunity as president. Uh, we had the GM 40 day strike in 2019. Donald Trump was completely silent, never said a word. Uh, we had Lordstown Assembly plant that was slated to close in 2019. Donald Trump told people, don't sell your houses. And he did nothing but blame the local union president, which was a complete joke. You know, Joe Biden in 2023, we had the same situation. A plant in Belvedere, Illinois, was slated to close. 
Joe Biden engaged us. We got involved. We worked together, and we found the solution, not just to save a closing plant, but to add a second plant there and also save a dying community. Yeah. Uh, you know, Joe Biden joined us on the picket line and stood with us. Uh, you know, this, you know, Trump put in anti-union NLRB people, you know, on the board and killed organizing. All, all the positive momentum we have going right now in this country for working class people. I mean, 75 percent of Americans supported us in our contract fight because the principles we're fighting for wages, better benefits, health care, you know, retirement security, getting our time, getting our lives back. That's what matters to working class people. Donald Trump doesn't want any of that for working class people. And, he, you know, he used the term weapon of mass destruction. The only weapon of mass destruction we've faced in the last 40 years has been corporate greed, because that's what drives this. And that's Trump's yeah. world. Well, uh, if you will, uh, President Fain, talk about what happened during the strike for those watching that didn't didn't follow it so closely. We had Joe Biden going on the picket line, first president in U.S. history to do that. What did Donald Trump do? Yeah, so that you know, again, it's it's a it's a perfect contrast between the two candidates. I mean, you have for the first time in history a sitting U.S. president joining working class people, joining the workers on the picket line, standing up with them, and you had Donald Trump, who claims he supports the workers, who calls one of his business owner buddies, and uh, in a non-union factory, and he goes to this non-union factory and has a rally claiming that he's there for, you know, the union workers and the striking workers. It, it's it's what Trump does best. It's, it's a rope-a-dope. Um, you know, he, he wants you to look over here while over here he's taking everything away. I mean, I, uh, you know, it's the divide-and-conquer tactic, and uh, that's, that's yeah. what's worked for the billionaire class and the corporate class forever. You know, they divide us over race. They divide us over gender. I mean, even I heard you guys talking earlier about border security, even border security. You know, when I, when I look at that issue, I, I see my grandparents. You know, the only difference, when I see destitute people that are desperate trying to cross a border to find a better life, in America that we used to be the beacon, you know, we welcome your sick, bring us your sick, your needy, bring us your poor. You know, I see my grandparents who were destitute coming out of a depression. They moved north from the south. They found jobs in the UAW and it changed their lives. They lived the American dream. That's that's what this is all about. We can't continue to let the billionaire class and the corporate class divide us over issues when, because that's how they win. Uh, and the issues that matter to us that matter to all working class people is having security in their lives, having dignity, you know, when they're too old to work and too young to die. Sean, good morning. Great to have you back on the show. Let's talk about the workers in your union a little bit and the future of the American yeah. auto workers. You know, it's it's gone in waves here and the push toward electric vehicles seems to be a little bit of a pullback on that at the moment. Some of the deficiencies in those, a future that's gone electric. The Biden administration has gone big, saying that's going to create more jobs. This is where we're headed. How do you see the present of the American auto worker and then the, the future a few years down the road? Well, look, we, you know, you know, we embrace technology changes, uh, you know, that we always have. And the UAW has always stood, you know, for a clean environment. Um, you know, Walter Ruther famously said back in, in his time, you know, that what good's another dollar an hour in wages or another week's vacation if the if the place you go to, you know, take your vacation, you can't swim in a lake or you can't breathe the air. I mean, it's a. Uh, you know, it goes back to that. I mean, uh, we don't know where this is going to go, but we've done we've put provisions in place. We've worked again with the Biden administration, uh, you know, Secretary of Labor, Julie Sue, to put provisions in place that no matter where this industry goes, whether it's electric, uh, whether it, it, internal combustible engine continues, whatever that is, that, that working class people will continue to benefit and, and will have better standards. We'll have our standards, not a race to the bottom, which is what Donald Trump drives. And. You know, we can't be afraid of change. And uh, uh, so, you know, we've, we've covered both ends of the spectrum and, and whatever technology comes down the road, we'll embrace that also. I mean, uh, wherever this market goes, uh, our workers are going to be OK. Sean, as we approach this election and you've made this endorsement, you, uh, I'm sure, have looked at the polls. You've looked at uh, those that have said there's not a lot of energy in terms of uh, uh, people turning out. What will labor do? Uh, that now UAW and others have endorsed Biden to energize the laborers, the union members, to come out and vote, because all of this is moot if your endorsement does not carry the weight of bringing out members and likewise other union leaders. 
Yeah, th- I mean, this, this endorsement and this election, it's about a hell of a lot more than just organized labor. But organized labor has to lead this fight, and we're going to lead it. Um, you know, this is about humanity. Um, you know, where do we want to go as a nation? I mean, do we want to continue on this 40- or 50-year downward spiral we've been on where, you know, this we have this massive income inequality, this income, this, this wealth gap? You know, I, I read the other day an Economic Policy Institute study where in 43-year period, from 79, you know, right when Reagan took over in 80, till 2022, the top 0.1% wages increased 344%. The bottom 90% of us in America increased 32%, which if you if you factor 3% average inflation a year, we weren't even anywhere near keeping up with inflation while the billionaire class and the wealthy took all the, all the profits. That's what this is all about. We have to focus on humanity. Uh, you know, there's a reason why Trump and then want to cut Social Security benefits and they want, you know, they don't want, you know, Medicare for all and they don't want health care for all because they want to concentrate all the wealth in their hands. They want to take everything and leave everybody else fending for themselves. That's not something that works for us, but labor's going to lead this fight um, and uh, we're in it. Uh, and, and, you know, our members have to look at the reality. We have to look at facts. That's mm. why our contract campaign was so successful because we put the facts out there of the gross inequality between the companies and the workers. And it's the same situation in our politics. There is gross inequality with the few at the top and everyone else at the bottom. We have to look at facts, not fiction, not not alternative facts or lies, as as Trump likes to talk about, real facts. And and the facts are very clear. President of the United Auto Workers, Sean Fain, thank you very much for coming on the show this morning. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right. Still.